All right, so we've got uh, Josh and Gino here to talk about some work and some explorations we've been doing on uh, dynamic client registration of trusted apps. Uh, we, we set aside some time last week just to explore some of the specifications and do some reference implementations and just understand what some of the challenges are here. So before I dig in with kind of a little bit of a slide deck overview, uh, anything you want to share, Gino, to orient folks to this work? Um, yeah, no, I think uh, you covered it. It's just for uh, registering applications uh, dynamically uh, so that they can go through and do a smart app launch on behalf of users uh, without uh, registering the applications directly uh, ahead of time with the providers. So for level setting. Awesome. And I've got a couple of um, pictures just to try to sort of ex explain what's going on here. So what we have today in the Smart on Fire spec is the idea that, like, let's say that my personal health app um, is published in an app store and it's running on lots of different people's phones. And those phones are going to connect directly to an EHR. And so the data are moving right from a health record into the phone. We're going to limit ourselves to those kinds of apps. Um, and what we have today is that if the app is running on three different phones, it's got the same client ID on all three of those phones. So in this example, it's client ID one. Um, and it has no key or no secret to, to speak of. So the security of the app kind of comes from its ability to listen on a particular redirect URL. So like bloodpressure.example.org. Uh, the fact that this app can listen and receive redirects on that URL combined with some techniques like um, Pixie uh, give you a good degree of security for apps that are built this way. But there's more that you might want that goes even um, beyond this architecture. So if you imagine client number one running on the first phone here, it gets a refresh token. So it's going to be uh, given ongoing access to my data. Let's say I've granted it that ongoing access. Now, if you imagine somebody is able to steal that refresh token from, uh, from the app, anybody who steals it might be able to trade that refresh token in for a new access token, um, which is not ideal. So we're going to think about approaches that uh, can do a little bit better by binding things to a key that lives on the, the device. And the idea here is that if my app is running on three different devices, each one would have a different client ID. Um, in the example here, this should say one and two and three. Um, and each time the client is registered, it could be associated with a different private key. Uh, so you know, a key for device A and device B and device C. Uh, and you can just gloss over uh, the, the little copy paste errors that I've got here. The idea is different client IDs and different keys. Um, but all these apps are following the same template. So they all have the same uh, app name and they're definitely gonna have the same redirect URL and they'll be eligible for the same scopes and so on. Uh, and so this is a vision that we'd like to be able to, to work towards where the app developer can register that template once um, and have all these details confirmed and reviewed um, and maybe even publicly published but then when they go to register an app on each device, it can be bound to its own keys. That's what we want to get to. Um, and so we started off by looking at specs from um, UDAP. I think that stands for the Unified Data Access uh, Profiles. And I guess if I click on the link here, uh, I can actually check. Un Unified Data Access Profiles. Uh, and this is a draft. There are a few specs here that are drafts that go back to 2019 and a little earlier. Um, but they're making their way through, or parts of these are making their way through an HL7 uh, standardization process, which is why Gino and I uh, kind of perked up and, and thought, uh, maybe we should take a look at, at how these things are coming along and how they apply to some of these use cases. Um, so one concept that UDAP defines is this notion of an endorsement uh, or a certification that an app can have. Um, and I've represented this JSON web signature as kind of a green box containing a bunch of details that have been signed over. So these are um, specific details like the name of the app and the redirect URI and the name of the developer and the location of the privacy policy, all the kinds of OAuth details that you might care about at registration time. And very commonly today, you would register these kinds of details with an EHR vendor in their portal. So maybe I go to open.epic.com uh, or code.cerner.com and I register my app with the vendor. Uh, but UDAP also envisions a process where this registration might not happen directly with one vendor at a time, but it could even happen with something like a, a trust framework, where independent of any specific product, uh, an organization sets up a registration portal. Uh, but we don't care too much about that distinction um, for our purposes here. We just care about the fact that somebody, whether it was an EHR vendor or a trust framework, but somebody is able to verify all these app details and create an endorsement JWS for the app developer. And this is a signed artifact that the app developer now has that locks down all the details of their app 
and also in some way locks down uh, the authentication keys that that developer can use, either by directly supplying them or by pointing to them in some kind of an X509 um, certificate chain. Uh, but, but somehow this signed statement identifies the app details and also identifies public keys for the app developer. And then the theory becomes, once the app developer has this endorsement JSON web signature, um, they might be able to then go and register their app with uh, one specific copy of their app on one specific device, register that with um, a registration endpoint at a particular health system. So in the example, we're, I'm going to be registering a copy of this app with mercy.example.org, and they have a dynamic registration endpoint. Um, and the idea here is the app developer is going to take a couple things. They're going to take their endorsement, which they've already got, and they're going to present that along with a software statement, so a new artifact that they're going to create each time they need to register an instance of the app. And by submitting those two things together, uh, they can get a new app instance register. Um, and so what that means is there's two inputs to this register um, endpoint. One is uh, an array of certifications or endorsements. And the other one is what's called a software statement. And so in our example, the app is going to present an endorsement, JWS, as that first input. And it's going to present its own software statement representing the copy of the app on a particular device um, as the second input. And there's an important set of relationships here. So first of all, Mercy needs to trust this endorsement, JWS, or they need to trust the endorser who signed it uh, if this kind of flow is going to work. So maybe uh, it's a vendor-specific trust model where Mercy represents um, a site from a particular vendor, and they trust all endorsements that are signed by their vendor. That's one possibility. Or it could be an externalized trust framework where Mercy um, trusts anything with the good app seal of approval, and this endorsement has been signed by the, the good app seal. Um, either one of those models works just fine, as long as somehow Mercy trusts the, the signer of this endorsement. And then the software statement uh, has to have the same details, or at least consistent details, uh, with what have been locked down in the JWS. And the reason that these aren't necessarily identical is that any given copy of the app, when it registers, could choose to only register a subset of those details. So if this app has been endorsed with five different redirect URIs for different platforms, but the iOS version of the app is only ever going to use one of those, it might just present a, a subset of those redirect URIs. Um, so these are either identical or, um, or at least consistent. Uh, you can't go ahead and ask for something new here when you register your instance of the app. You're limited to what's been registered um, at the time of endorsement or what's been reviewed at the time of endorsement. And then this software statement also conveys a new set of um, public keys representing this particular device. So like maybe these are keys that live on my iPhone in the secure hardware uh, module there, and they can never be extracted. And the software statement will be able to point to those. And this whole statement is signed by the same public keys that the endorser uh, has already um, signified can be used to securely identify this developer. So this whole JSON web key set, or sorry, no, this whole JSON web signature software statement is signed by these developer public keys. And this is a little bit of a complicated picture here, um, but I just wanted to just explain this in enough detail that you can start to get a sense of the fact that there's these two signed artifacts. One was generated ahead of time, and one is generated just in time for one specific device. And every time we go through this workflow, this endorsement would stay the same. But as we register a new device, we get a new software statement um, yeah. to register that specific device. And Gino, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, important to note that that software statement can be done just in time for a single device. But the UDAP protocol also, if you wanted to use the uh, good app seal of approval, as we were talking about before, you could still register that for the entire, essentially, class of devices and not worry about per device keys. Uh, if you wanted to say my app is only going to use this one set of keys, uh, you would still want to use UDAP so that you get that broad registration trust framework uh, without having these individual keys. We wanted to push on this area in particular uh, because we think it's an important piece of security <laughs> architecture that should be included. Uh, but you know, there is a slightly simpler, slightly less secure way of doing this, going through this process and using these uh, specifications, which is still beneficial uh, and arguably better than not having. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. We're, we're pushing on how to achieve this device-specific registration kind of flow, uh, and it's, it's actually a more complicated problem than just 
trusted registration in general. We're, we're making lives hard. We're making our lives harder than they need to be because we want to enable this this kind of device specific security. Um, yes. And it's maybe not the easiest or first play that you want to deploy UDAP, uh, but it's where we wanted to start just to you know explore some of the boundary conditions. Um, so pushing through on this example, once a developer submits these two pieces of data as inputs to the registration endpoint, then they get an output, which is they've now registered an app instance. And this is going to have its own unique client ID. And it's going to have um, you know, some non-extractable key that lives on the device. And this instance is fully defined by uh, whatever was submitted in this software statement. Um, so at this point, the app instance just becomes this, this technical artifact that now can differentiate the copy of the app on my device from the copy of the app on Gino's device. And even if somehow Gino manages to steal my refresh tokens, uh, he won't be able to use them because he won't have um, this non-extractable key that only lives on my phone. Um, so that's the, the basic story that we wanted to tell in terms of how these pieces fit together using um, UDAP. Uh, and we want to get to the state where you've registered an instance of the app on your specific device. Uh, so with that, we were going to do a quick demonstration um, of some of the software that we put together last week. We did this quick project, which, which lives here in the UDAP spike repository. Um, and we've got just kind of a live copy of it uh, running on the screen share here. And if we've got time, we'll also talk through some of the discovered issues uh, that we figured out over the course of, of putting this demo together. Uh, but maybe, Gino, since I've got the screen share running over here, um, you want to narrate and I can go through the, the workflow of uh, registering the test app. Sure. Uh, and yeah, I apologize. I, I didn't notice until seeing it on the screen share that it's uh, from the uh, base template I copied. The title is the granular scopes app. So, uh, but uh, in the UDEP, <laughs> so uh, that'll be fixed in a future uh, push. Uh, so in this case, what happens is we have a client host that's running in the background uh, that is the, uh, as we were talking before, the developer registered version. So there's a developer registration that's happened already and the class app registration that's happened already. Uh, and then at this point, uh, we're looking at what would be on the client's device or, or even in this, as it's working here, that you are a user session on a web page. Uh, and so the most important thing is obviously the fire server we want to talk to, and that's just a base URL. Uh, and then this client ID is actually going to get overwritten. So that's our initial client ID that we have registered internally. Uh, but then uh, as we connect to the server, we are going to uh, change that to a device client ID. Uh, this is just normal scopes. And uh, there we go. So there's a few buttons here. Again, uh, some of them are uh, just the basic smart, you know, launch and auth, redirect, refresh a token, get the smart configuration. Uh, I do want to note that this is one of the places where we diverged from the published spec is uh, actually, Josh, if you wouldn't mind hitting this get smart config. Uh, this response data does include all of the UDAP information as well. Uh, in the published spec, I believe there's a separate well-known endpoint uh, that has just the UDAP information. And I think that's being resolved in ballot. Uh, but I just wanted to call out here that this is uh, the way that this is implemented. So it has all the UDAP endpoints and things like that that we would need to do it. Uh, if we're interested, we can get the controller info. Uh, that's just showing the uh, information that we were talking about that it has the, uh, and you can yeah, minimize those or however, uh, but it just has uh, an endorser API, a developer ID and an app ID. Um, the one on the right will minimize them, yep. Um, I'll note that uh, we did just for, again, uh, <clears throat> entertainment value, if nothing else, uh, we're using a fire server for all of the back end. So when we register the application, we're registering, I believe, an organization, uh, and we actually create a fire resource for that in the fire server. Uh, and then the applications are all registered as devices and things like that. Um, again, just for, uh, because it's a fun project. So when we do go ahead and click the register UDAP client, that's the one that's actually asking the controller uh, to go and register this session uh, with the um, EHR, <coughs> excuse me, EHR uh, as a separate device. And so there's all the response data here that you can see um, coming through. There's the redirect URIs that uh, were all registered, the grant types, and all of the keys and everything else that we need. Uh, you can see there, there's our new client ID. 
And again, since we registered this device, this user session as a new device, uh, it has its own client ID. And in our case, we're just using WIDS because that's easy. And this is kind of the, the magic sauce right here. This is what makes this instance of the app different from every other one. It's, it's got its own client ID and its own JSON web key that no other client instance uh, has. And then yep. Gino promised this would be updated. Now that we've registered our own instance, uh, the UI has updated this client ID to reflect that fact. Yes. Uh, and then we can go through the normal smart. Uh, there's the launch. Oh, yeah. That's, that's right. So, so we registered the app, and now, now we can connect it to the EHR. And this yep. is the step where the user is actually involved, right? So I, I, now that I've got a copy of this app registered, um, this would all happen automatically without me having to do anything. Now yep. here's a step where I've got to do something. I say, I want to connect this app to my EHR. So I'm going to launch a smart app here. Um, and there's a couple of ways that you could authenticate, but I'm just going to click the fake login button because it's, it's easier. But think about this as a patient portal where you'll be approving or denying an app's request to access data. And I can see exactly what scopes it's asking for. I can see the fact that it has this certification uh, because this was presented in the endorsement and it's a certifier that this EHR trusts. So it highlights the fact that this app has this certification that's been verified. Um, and so this is really just like a little placeholder to say the UI for app approval um, can really become a lot more tailored and give users a lot more trust when there's this kind of upfront certification being done. Uh, even though this app was just registered two minutes ago, it's following a template that has been certified and it has all the properties of that certified app. So of course, since this app is, is so trustworthy, I'm gonna go ahead and improve um, the access request that this app has made. Uh, and now we're back uh, having completed the Smart on Fire launch and our app has got um, an access token, I think. We'll see. Yep. This was that the access token response that the app got based on my approval, um, which there's not too much to see, but it's going to last for an hour. And it's got these scopes. And here's the actual access token. Um, I'm not going to have some any, any really interesting API responses to show, but that access token can be used to make queries to the server. In this case, I'm successfully making a query to fetch all patients from the server. Um, and you can see I've got some really excellent demo data loaded into my server, and I've returned all zero patients. Um, but it's a successful search. And if I tried it again with an invalid access token, um, I would get an error because that search would not be allowed. So that's the, the sort of end of the, the OAuth flow, showing how an app can register its own instance. And then once it's registered, a user can um, approve it in the smart app launch. Yeah, and I think that it's really important to highlight that that uh, authorization screen can have, you know, if we're going back to our earlier example, the good app seal of approval. Um, you know, you can, depending on which um, trust organizations, trust frameworks you participate in, you can really show all that information here and kind of build this up uh, similar. I, I compare it in my head to the same way we have uh, HTTP versus HTTPS that, you know, when HTTPS first came out, it was kind of like, okay, yes, it's there and that's it. Uh, and then it started getting more intense that anytime you didn't use it, you, it starts throwing, you know, putting warning messages saying this is not secure. Uh, if it's from an organization you've not worked with before, it'll throw a different one, things like that. And so it really allows the EHRs to work with a lot of these things dynamically and not worry about approving every single and reviewing every single app. Uh, you can say as a developer, yes, I'm going to work with this trust framework and it's a popular one and it's well supported and uh, users can come to a screen and see, okay, well, yes, you've been identified as a good app by a trustworthy name that my EHR likes without the admin having to go and approve this individual app for this particular user because they wanted to use it. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And it's just worth saying that trust framework could be some outside organization that spans across vendors, or it could even be just a, you know, a way for an existing vendor portal to represent uh, which apps have been registered and reviewed with, with that portal. Uh, so it's a pretty flexible kind of technology. Um, the last thing I wanted to do is just to point out um, a couple of the discovered issues that we documented as we were going through the process. Um, I think it's fair to say, you know, that our approach last week was like, just keep writing code until it works. Um, and we tried to just sort of document the assumptions we were making or the places where the specs um, were, were falling short uh, as we went. So we just sort of documented this set of this discovered issues. 
And so, I mean, the main thing to highlight from the UDAP perspective is it, it really would be nice if UDAP supported this pattern of trusted per device registration. It's sort of out of scope for, for V1 of UDAP, but given where we are in V1 right now, um, I think actually it should be in scope, um, where at least the V1 spec should allow for this kind of thing. And there's a couple places right now that make that really hard or, or even outright prevent it. Um, so there's a little bit of language in the, the UDAP draft spec that talks about this protocol only being used by clients, uh, like confidential clients and certain native device apps. Um, I, I think the use of the word may here is a little confusing. I think it's trying to say shall not um, rather than may only, um, but I'm not exactly sure about the intent on that front. Um, but the, I think the, the bigger issue from my perspective is making sure that like when this software statement is presented to the registration server, uh, UDAP should account for the case where that, that, that software statement might be signed by the app's controller, like signed by the developer of the app, um, even though it's identifying keys um, directly like that are going to be used by an instance of the app uh, and being able to tie together, you know, the, from our picture here, this, this notion where the signature here is coming from the developer's keys, even though the instance keys uh, for this particular copy might be different. Um, so that's something that I think ought to be supported in UDAP um, in kind of a first class way. Um, and then there was one other kind of surprising bit about the actual metadata in UDAP for these certifications. So there's something called a certification name, which is optional, zero or one. But then there's also a list of certification URIs, which goes from zero to star. And so it's, it was a little bit confusing to say if, if this app has three certifications, each identified by a different policy, but only one name, um, you know, how do you bring those together? Um, and there's also logos to think about. So it might be a cleaner design to support an array of, of certification objects, each with a name, a URI, and a logo. Um, or if, if that's overly complicated, just constrain everything to be zero to one um, so that we don't have some things that repeat uh, and some things that don't. Um, so in a lot of our implementations here, uh, and maybe this is colored by some of the work we've done on smart health cards, uh, we were leaning towards using JSON web key set directly or using JSON web key set URIs um, in a way that's sort of complementary to X509 trust frameworks. Not everybody participates in this kind of X509 based trust framework. Uh, and there's some scenarios that are just quite simple to be able to publish keys um, at a well-known URL. We've done that in health cards with X509 as an option. Uh, and I think we can say you know, both of those options are, are pretty powerful. So rather than prohibiting the use of a JSON web key set URL, um, it'd be nice if you'd allow that as an option. Uh, right now, it prohibits it in a little bit of a, a misleading way, sort of in a, in a little note that feels like it's just calling out a reference to the underlying dynamic registration spec, but it's actually layering on um, some new prohibitions. So it's at least worth getting a little bit of clarity um, on that front. And then the signature algorithms. We went ahead and used RS-256 in most places in our demo because it's the only algorithm that's um, actually documented in UDAP. But I think this should be more of an open set. Uh, we used different signing algorithm choices and smart health cards and CDS hooks and smart backend services. I should say backend. Um, and it'd be nice to, to make sure those things weren't disallowed uh, in UDAP so that those existing specifications um, could work just the same um, with these workflows. And then a couple other small, small bugs and details. But those are the main things that, that I wanted to point out. Um, Nothing insurmountable, but but some significant changes that I would love to see um, over the course of resolving um, the, the ballot around some of these components of UDAP. Uh, any other uh, discoveries from, from your perspective, Gino, that either we don't have on the list or, or that I could have highlighted better from this list? Yeah, no, I think uh, definitely the, uh, J the JWKS URI is an important one just because the RFC they're re referring to actually lists that as the preferred method. Uh, and so I think it is important if they are going to, if the spec is going to disallow it, that it's very clear about the fact that it is and why, uh, because it's actually in contrary, uh, in contrast to the RFC underneath. Um, you know, I had been uh, fairly daunted by the X509 stuff uh, coming into it just because uh, I haven't used that in this context, but ended it up pretty much any library that we were looking at that supported all of the JWKS stuff we needed also had X509 support. So that ended up being pretty much a non-issue for a lot of those pieces. Um, overall, I think the specification could use a lot more um, detail in the examples. Um, there were some pages that we looked at 
just in uh, UDAP in general and different things like that, that we had to do a lot of trial and error to figure out the exact workflow. Uh, and that will come obviously as the specification progresses, but I do think it's an important to point of saying, you know, what are the actual responsibilities of each of these actors and what would it look like to implement uh, just from the point of view that the, uh, the examples there are pretty thin and pretty uh, general showing everything all together, uh, which you're not concerned about if you're writing a client or a server or whatever, you only really need to know those pieces. So I think those are the, my biggest uh, additions to those. Cool, and you, you reminded me um, also, if there's a, an open source reference implementation of UDAP, um, we missed it. So we, we wound up sort of building a few of these components for ourselves, both as a learning exercise, but also because we needed uh, an implementation of an endorser and an implementation of an EHR that could do dynamic registration in order to be able to build an app that tested out some of these ideas. Um, and it was a good exercise, um, but it's also just worth saying if there, if there are resources out there already that cover some of this in an open source implementation, um, it'd be good to highlight those from the spec because um, frankly, there's a, there's a lot of complexity. And what we really wanted to do was just build an app and show what that looked like. But in, in the course of that, we had to do a full on implementation of, of all the different sides of that API. Yep. Cool. All right, well, I, I think we should call it a wrap here. Um, this, this has been a fun week. We learned a lot about uh, UDAP um, and looking forward to taking the conversation forward with the Fire community. Same, thanks. Cheers. All right, take care.